Yeah, this is a huge question. The incarnation is one of the central doctrines of the Christian faith. And um, it is because of the God incarnate that we are able to have a Savior uh, who was not only born into human society, but grew up and suffered and died and then was raised up in it. So without the incarnation, we have no hope. We have no um, forward look at the resurrection. We don't have a purpose in life. Now, having said that, the incarnation should not be taken as a, a model one-to-one -one for everything we do. The obvious example is, you know, we, we don't go around forgiving sins and doing miracles the way Jesus did, um, nor is our death redemptive the way his was. Um, so the incarnation is incredibly central, but it's not a model for everything. How does it relate to the arts and culture? Well, one thing that the incarnation affirms is that God cares about his creation. Um, the, the relationship is without the, the creation, without Genesis 1, 2, and 3, um, and the good intentions that God has for the creation and for his creatures, um, the incarnation would be a, a out of the blue uh, intrusion into a world that is foreign to it. As it is, the incarnation blesses confirms and corrects the, the creation, particularly when the creation has gone wrong. So it's very important to realize that um, culture, the arts, are part of the creation mandate. Um, when God said to multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, uh, one of the implications of that is the implication of, of making culture. Um, subduing the earth is not just a matter of agriculture, though it is, but it's a matter of uh, building cities and having families and creating music and um, all of the blessings of, of um, the arts that God has given us. And those are not abrogated with the fall. They are redefined. And the incarnation helps us redefine it and affirm it. I'll give you an example from the Bible. Um, Psalm 8 tells us in a magnificent way that God still honors the creation mandate or the cultural mandate, as it's sometimes called. It begins, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And then it concludes that he is still, though a little lower than the angels, called to rule over the world, the animals, um, and in a word, culture. Now. Hebrews chapter 2 quotes this psalm, but applies it to Jesus. Um, he's not just a man born lower than the angels, but he is the man, Jesus Christ, who, uh, whose birth and incarnation signifies the redemption of, of culture. So Hebrews says, though we don't see everything under his feet, ne nevertheless we see Jesus, so we know that it's heading in the right direction. So this sounds very abstract, but um, it can be very practical for uh, doing the arts, for building cities, for um, every bit of culture making, uh, because it affirms the good part of creation, it corrects the bad part, and it tells us it's going in a place of uh, finality where Jesus is leading us out of a dark world um, into a world where he is the Lord of Lords, and he subdues all things to himself, including what we call culture. So it's critical to begin our theology uh, with uh, God's relation to the creation. Uh, we, we sometimes summarize it in a tripartite way, creation, fall, redemption. And if you don't begin with creation, you, if you begin, let's say, with the fall, uh, then there's something inherently bad about the world that God has made. And in fact, in Genesis, it tells us that it was good and very good. So having begun with the creation and believing that the cultural mandate, subdue the earth, 
and uh, rule over it is still in, in vogue, then um, we go into the realms of history, into the fallen world, into the new world of redemption, and we ask, where do the creation mandates stand in these episodes of, of history? And the biblical answer is that while much needs to be corrected because it's fallen into idolatry, yet the good parts um, have been affirmed and are heading in a Christological direction. So it's not only affirming them, but it's lifting them to a higher plane. Um, let me give you an example of, I think, one, one thing that has encouraged me a great deal about culture making, and it's, it's counterintuitive. Um, during the Babylonian exile, um, the people of God were spread around, and some of them were concentrated into the area of Babylon. And um, there were false prophets going around saying, grit your teeth, it's not going to last that long. Uh, don't, don't get involved, um, God will save you. And then the Lord tells Jeremiah, and he writes it in a famous letter recorded in Jer Jeremiah 29, that tell the people, even though they're in exile, to have families, build houses, plant vineyards, and work for the shalom of the city, for in its shalom shall your shalom be. It's counterintuitive because you think if you're in exile, uh, what's the point of helping out something that's such an alien and enemy uh, surrounding? And God says, no, culture making is about aiding the enemy and improving the enemy and, and leading the enemy to a, a new place. And as you do so, you will, be, you will be improving yourself. So Jeremiah 29 tells us that culture making is... Uh, as relevant or more so in a hostile world than it might be in a unfallen world. So uh, this is a great encouragement to culture makers of all sorts, whether it be artists, um, it, whether it be citizens, whether it be lawyers, whether it be family creators, uh, because even in a hostile world, we're to make culture and bring shalom, a wonderful Hebrew word for wholeness and peace to a fallen world.